coordinate the career ministry here at All Saints Catholic Church, and um, it is a very big blessing to serve with a number of volunteers that are in the room tonight. Uh, so before we go ahead and pray, which we always like to start with, I'm going to ask anyone who volunteers in our ministry if you could stand, um, just so that others uh, can know who you are. And you 
change and you ascend to U version 2. And guess what? U version 2 inevitably is going to look at goal version 1 and go, I don't think that's for me anymore. <laughs> for whatever reason, it could be you want to seek something different, something better, something higher. So inevitably you come up with goal version 2. And so the process, if we do this well, can really look like an evolution upward. So instead of us getting so married to the one thing that we want to do, the idea here is how do we maintain this for life as we grow evolve? How do we continue to update our vision as we change? Does that sound good? Okay. If you have something to take notes on, I highly recommend you get that out. Paper, get there some pens, uh, some notepads on the table. Uh, I am just, for funsies, selling my book and uh, happy to talk to you more about that at the end. But if you buy a book, you get a free notebook with it and you can take notes on the notebook. So, uh, and it's the honor system, by the way. There's a QR code over there. Okay, so let's jump right into this. Thank you guys so much for sharing. I really just, I like to start there so that level set so we know where everyone is in the room and what they're looking for. Again, focus on your one nugget for where you are right now. Be selfish, okay? All right, so what is the real cost of lacking clarity? Um, we've all seen over the last two years that the only certainty that we have going on in our lives right now, let alone any time in our lives, is uncertainty. The only thing that we can really count on is change, which I love uh, that, that uh, this young woman brought up, right? The, the world's going to change five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, let alone are we going to have to deal with global pandemics and crazy things going on that we can't control. So how do we maintain clarity for the long haul? And what's it really costing us when we don't have it? Well, I found over the last seven years that I've been in business, but really over the last two with my conversations with our students, that in times of great uncertainty, the thing that allows us to rise above the noise is a depth of personal clarity. When you have a laser-focused vision for yourself, when you know the value that you offer and bring to the table with depth and clarity, then everyone else who's confused is the rabble part of the noise, and you're the one that rises above. So you're the interview that stands out. You're the resume that stands out. You're the conversation over coffee that stands out because you're the one who knows what you want and you know what you're going to say. So today I really want to encourage you to think narrowly and to think focused. So many, many, many of us, myself included, would consider ourselves multi-passionate. I like all kinds of things. I'm incredibly excitable. So much like you, ma'am, I am all about, oh, that person's thing over there, that sounds fun. I want to do that. And I think it's so easy distracted, but much of what we entertain on a day-to-day -day basis is simply that, distraction. It is not our true north. It is not our most narrow focus where we have the best chance of adding the most value. So I say that again. Where do you have the best chance of adding the most value out in the world? That's the narrowness of focus that I want you to focus on today. Because the stakes are incredibly high. First of all, you've got money, right? If you're not narrowly focused in your niche in the world, then it's highly likely that you're leaving some value on the table because we do operate in a capitalist market. So if you have more value to add, then hopefully you can get more value out of the work that you do every day. Then we've got time, which unlike money, is not a renewable resource. You can always make more money, but you cannot make any more time. This one's huge to me because I think the longer that we wait and the longer that we linger in or, oh, the benefits are good, or, oh, I can't be without health insurance. Like, I've literally taken a job just so I could have dental insurance again. It was bad. <laughs> it did not go well for me. Uh, but the opportunity cost of time wasted can't be overstated. And then, of course, last but not least, this is your life. I think one of the reasons I love speaking to Catholic communities and religious communities specifically is that we all have a belief that we're here for a reason. And the longer we put off doing some of this potentially challenging work, but really meaningful work, the, the longer we put off the purpose of our lives in that moment. And one of the things Natalie shared is that purpose can't change and evolve, but we have to be present and aware of where we are in our lives, the circumstances, what our values are, and the purpose that we have to live in that moment. I learned that from actually a um, very sweet counselor that I used to work with, who was also Catholic, who I said, okay, Diana, I know what my business is gonna be. This is right when I started. She's like, what? I'm so excited. And I said, it's gonna be uh, do what you were made for. And then I hushed, you know, she's gonna tell me this is amazing. 
And she's like, I don't like it. Very lucky, very happy to do it. 
one of the things that they taught us when we were growing up in back was that if you're aiming at a ball and you aim at one tiny spot on the ball, you have a much greater chance of hitting some, somewhere on the ball and actually making contact. But if you're trying to swing just at this big glob of a ball, you could miss completely. So they used to say, aim small, miss small. The goal here is that we're aiming for where you're now, which is your values, your commitments, your vision, meets your nature, which is your gifts, your personality, your behaviors, then meets your nurture, which is your knowledge and your skills and your strengths. Okay, if we can marry all three of those things, you are a triple threat in your position. Yes? Who wants to be a triple threat? Choose, do you aspire to? 
What represents the best part of you that you love, that you value the most, that you want to leverage maybe? What are the greatest things that have happened to you in life? How do they make you feel? The goal here is to come up with just a list of words and phrases. Does everyone understand? I'm going to give us three minutes to do that. That sounds like not a lot of time, but when it's silent, I promise it will be. <laughs> All right, three minutes, ready, and go. Thirty more seconds to wrap up your thoughts.
absolutely done. Okay, so uh, you sat here beautifully and clearly knew what your core values were. Do you want to share your number one core value? You got it. You want stability. Yes. I love that. You know what? Stability ended up in my core values this year for the first time ever. I, I have been out of going back five or six years because I would do this every year for myself and my business and try to practice what I preach, you know. Show it for the first time ever this year. So kudos to that. Who else has a core value they want to share? I feel like around the room and take those two long. There's a lot more people here, which is exciting. Anybody? Number one core value? Yeah. What does that mean to you? Um, being really cognizant of where you're spending your time and your mm. resources. Beautiful. I love that. Yes, intention. That's what today's all about, is coming up with this data so that we can move forward intentionally. So, well done. You're in the right place. Awesome. Okay, let's move right along. We're going to go into fit factor number two, which is nature. Remember, nature is your personality, your gifts, your behaviors. Um, I think that this part cannot be overstated how important our nature is when it comes to our career. And the examples that I like to use primarily are athletes and animals. Because when it comes to athletes and animals, I think we all can see very clearly that there are specific environments where each of those are going to thrive. So a swimmer is not going to be as effective if you put him on the track, right? And a giraffe is not going to be as effective if you stuck him um, anywhere else. <laughs> but the desert, am I right? So the important thing to remember here though is we are human beings and, and we work at jobs. And our offices and the, our places of work are not as different as an Olympic athletes event or an animal's ideal environment. So it can be so easy to forget that there are some environments that are really conducive to our success and other environments where it's going to be very challenging for that exact same person to succeed. That's why nature is so important. So I want to change your perspective today and have you start thinking, I don't need to be successful everywhere. What is the ideal environment that will set me up for success? Does that make sense, the difference? Uh, the quote that I've had on every one of these title slides is by Einstein. It says, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, then it will live its whole life feeling stupid. I started my career on Wall Street and never have I seen a better example of a fish trying to climb a tree and feeling stupid. So, I don't want that from you guys. So, I'm going to walk you quickly through the four behavior types on Myers Briggs. Who's heard of Myers Briggs before? It's pretty popular uh, personality and behavior assessment. Um, what I'm going to help you figure out is what your four letter combo is. We're going to do this real quickly. So if you've taken a Myers Briggs before, this should just be a nice reminder. If you've never done one before, hopefully this gives you a little insight. So the very first one that we're going to talk about is extroversion versus introversion. Ask yourself, do you prefer to focus on the outer world or your own inner world? If you prefer to focus on the outer world, you tend towards extroversion. If you prefer to focus on the inner world, then you will tend towards inner, uh, introversion. Who here feels like they're outer world extrovert. I'm surprised. Who feels like their inner world introvert, introspective? Beautiful, I love it. Okay, next let's go on to information. So this is sensing versus intuition. So this is where you're gonna be an S or an N. Do you prefer to focus on the basic information you take in, data from the world, or do you prefer to interpret and add meaning to that information? Oh, this makes me think of X, which maybe means that they would think more Y, which maybe means this is what it means, as opposed to just directly taking in the data and assessing. If you directly take in data and you focus on that basic information, you are more of a sensing individual, an S. If you prefer to interpret an ad meeting, you are an N. Who thinks that they are sensing basic data in 50-50 maybe? Fair enough. And then who thinks their intuition, N? Interpret an ad I am too. <laughs> Nothing is ever just data. Gotta kind of make sense of it, right? All right, next we're gonna talk decisions. So when making decisions, do you prefer to first look at logic and consistency? Or do you look at the people and the social circumstances of the decision? 
Again, this is just first preference. You could end up somewhere in the middle, that happens all the time. Uh, but if you have a gut reaction one way or the other, that's highly likely to be true for you. So, thinking versus feeling. Who prefers logic and consistency in their decisions? Yes? Who prefers people and special circumstances and making a thing? There we go. Yes, that's also, if you couldn't tell, that's also me. All right, last one, structure. So judging versus pers uh, prospecting. <clears throat> in dealing with the outside world, do you prefer to get things decided, boom, and move on? Or do you prefer to stay open to new information and options? I like to keep my options open, as it were. This is the structure component of the Myers-Briggs assessment. So who feels like they are all about decide, move on? Yes, I love you people. Okay, who's like, yeah, I like decisions, but I also like options. <laughs> my buffet people. Yes, okay, perfect. So those are your four letters, okay? Introversion is I, sensing is S, intuition is N, thinking is T, feeling is F, uh, judging is J, and prospecting is P. When you get home tonight, go to 16personalities.com and look up your personality. It is free, and they have so much data on this website, and will blow your mind. Okay? You'll have an archetype, you'll have a breakdown for your ideal work situation, who you should date and not date, like all this stuff, okay? It's a great website, go, go check it out. That's going to be your nature homework for tonight. Yes? Say yes, Tracy, I love homework. Yes, <laughs> All right, beautiful. Moving on, then back to number three. This is the one that's going to be a little bit of a test, because sometimes it is challenging to be objective about our own situations. Uh, but the goal of fit factor number three is to figure out where you add value based on what you've learned over time. Remember, this is your nurture. It is so crucial that we know our own value, that we know our own skills, our own knowledge, and our own expertise, and that we can actually articulate that to another human being, and I'll tell you why. Imagine you're an athlete, because at the end of the day, all of us are athletes. We all play on teams all day long, right? We all work with humans, and we all work for businesses, or we have a business that we run and own ourselves. That's a team. We're all working for organizations. Now imagine you're a manager, and you've got a whole team of people, but not a single one of them can tell you exactly where they should be on the field. How daunting would that be as a leader of an organization to have this whole incredible bench full of athletes, and yet none of them can tell you, yes, I'm a second baseman, you know why? It's because I've played there my whole life. I can feel beautifully. I can feel here, right? That's our goal, is to know our skills so deeply that we can tell somebody, hey, this is where I belong. And that's a huge part of identifying our nurture. So, I want you to introduce you to, that's not English. I want to introduce you to a concept. Uh, this is something that I learned while I was traveling after I quit Wall Street. I wanted nothing to do with my baby. Right? I had a miserable two and a half years there. I was burned out. I was over it. I never wanted to look at a spreadsheet again. I never wanted somebody to ask me where Toys R Us bonds were trading. Like, I wanted nothing to do with it. I was ready to toss the baby out with the bathwater. And I met this incredible woman who taught me this concept that nothing is wasted unless we choose to waste it. Now, you can put your ego first and your pride and say, no, I'm done with Wall Street. I'm never going to think about it again. And I really wanted to do that, but she challenged me. Look at that experience and ask yourself, what's one skill that you got from that that you didn't have before that you can see yourself using again? Maybe not all day, maybe not as your full-time job, but what's one skill, one nugget of information, one piece of knowledge that you have now that you didn't have before that you can see yourself using in the future? And so I looked and I actually thought, wow, I really learned a lot about myself, about the working world. I actually gathered some skills. I learned some new systems. Now, did I want to base a career on that? No. But by looking back at my previous experience, I could pull something out of it that made that otherwise not worthwhile experience really valuable. Okay? This is the challenge for anybody. Anybody ever hate their job? Right? And those of us who got one, two, three, four, five liars who didn't raise their hand. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, it happens, right? And so the goal here is to rise above. Pull something out to make it valuable and then move on with your life. So I want 
want you to think in terms of three different areas of your life. This is going to be homework. This is not something we can get super deep into tonight. But there are three areas to pull these skills and this knowledge and this expertise from. You've got maybe most obviously your work. So all of your work experience, paid and unpaid. Then you've got your education, both formal and informal. So yes, degrees and certifications, but also the school of life, books you read, podcasts you listen to, and then you've become an accidental armchair expert at simply by digesting all of that information. And then last but not least, your ninja skills. This is my favorite place to draw value from. You have traveled, you have hobbies, you have extracurricular activities, you might have volunteered. At the very least, you're a member of a church, <laughs> right? So there are places where you've utilized your skills and your knowledge and your expertise, and there are places where you've learned a lot that maybe didn't pay you. And that's where we pull our ninja skills from. This is especially for my younger ones who either haven't worked yet or have never had a job you liked. <laughs> I've had clients who have pulled their entire inspiration for their future career just from their hobbies, their extracurricular activities, and travel. There's a lot to be gained from that. And frankly, when you're just starting your career, that's where you have to draw a lot of your value from because those are the unique experiences that you've had. So I want each of you, before we move on, I want you to write down one nugget from each of these three areas. Something you're proud of, a piece of knowledge you have, a skill, some expertise that you got from one of each of these three areas. So if I this for me, I would be like, okay, education. Whoa. <laughs> That was too perfectly timed. Does that mean? That might have been me, right? Did you lean up against the wall? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I've done that many a time, don't worry. Okay, it's just so timed beautifully. Okay, so education, I would put psychology. I love studying psychology. I love learning about behavior and motivation in people. That would be my nugget for education. Work experience? Whew. I've had a lot of it. <laughs> One nugget for me, I think, would be that I love informal speaking. You know how some people just do beautiful keynotes and they don't use a single note, they don't have anything behind them, they make you laugh, they make you cry. Those people are magicians. And they work really hard to memorize every step of their speech. What I really love is this. I love going with the flow and audience and being asked questions. And so that's something I would call for work experience. And the ninja skills.
My nature tends to be a campaigner, a performer. My Myers Briggs is ENFP, if anybody's familiar with that. And I had this natural gift of speaking and putting ideas together. And then my nurture was that I had studied psychology. And so I had a lot of things to draw from, from my work experience, from my education. And that's, that was the magic. That was the sweet sauce that brought me to the idea of maybe I could build a clarity resource for other people. You know, maybe I could be the solution that I was looking for. And fewer people can suffer because of that, right? <laughs> I went through it the hard way. I like to say that I, like, I walked through a dark room for, for two years with like crap all over the floor, and I like, banged my toe, and you know, kicked my shin, and then I got to the other end of the room, and I got a flashlight. And then I could shine it on the ground and show people how to walk through that room with a little less pain. So that's what brought us here today, right? So your niche is gonna be unique for your situation, but remember, it's always gonna be now plus nature plus nurture, which by the way, is how you maintain clarity for life. If every year, at the beginning of the year, you check in and ask yourself, what do I care about at this phase of my life? How have I been ignoring my personality and living outside my comfort zone? What skills and knowledge and expertise did I gain in the past year that I can leverage going forward? That's how we reframe year after year after year based on how we've grown and how we've evolved. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I would love to stop there because I could just talk all night, and so I apologize for that. I really want to take questions. If anybody has them, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, but before we do, I just want to remind you there, if this concept is fascinating to you, if you want to go deeper into these exercises, I have books for sale. They walk you literally through every step of this process, doesn't miss a beat, um, and then you know, I'll sign it if you like. Uh, and anybody who buys a book tonight, it's a free notebook to take home with them. It's also brand new. Happy days. I'm just trying to get rid of the notebooks. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is where I'm going to wrap. Also, last thing, you can email your questions. I know you have them. And if you want to ask questions not in a group setting, you want to come up to me afterwards, that's totally fine too. Um, I'm going to make this offer to anyone who's here or to anyone who wishes their children were here because they really need it. Yes. Um, okay, this is this QR code on the screen links directly to my account. I do free 30-minute calls with anybody who really thinks they need more clarity and potentially wants to work with us. Um, but they're free, so no pressure, no nothing. If you have somebody in mind or you yourself want to get on my calendar, this is how you do it. Okay? This is a free offer if you guys want it. No pressure, no stress. So, what questions does anybody have that they want everyone to hear? <laughs> Uh, and if not, that's totally fine too. We can wrap it and I'm happy to answer questions perfectly as well. Tracy, do you have any questions? Do you want to take us off? No. Show up 
and do my job, you know what I mean? Instead of just having to sell it and then show up to do my job. So that was surprising, actually. Um, and so it's going to change how I how I run my business this year. Thank you for asking. Anybody else have questions? Can you about your situation or clarity in general? Did anybody did everybody get like a nugget? Can I get some handouts? Yeah. If you did get any nuggets, please come talk to me. I really hope that you walk away with at least one thing that serves you, even if it's something that's just a reminder or uh, something that shores up your confidence in an area. That's always been helpful. Any last questions before we break? Yes, and then, oh, yeah, go ahead. And I'll get Tracy. Yeah, I'm yes. So what do I tell everyone? Uh, his question was, what do you tell a person when they're going through a clarity process and their clarity is clouded by external expectations, what everyone thinks around him? And so I made the joke, what do I tell everybody? We're all living in a world where other people's ideas of us matter to some degree. Some people have freed themselves of that. They're called sociopaths. Uh, the rest of us, right, who <laughs> live in the real world, uh, care about what other people think, and it's something that's inextricable, I think, from the human experience because we were made for community. And anytime that somebody has a negative opinion of us, psychologically, we think we're going to lose that community or lose belonging. So we're hardwired to care what other people think. So I think that's the first thing to acknowledge is that that's normal. Um, then the degree to which it's helpful or harmful. Harmful? Harming? The degree to which it's serving you or not is really where, where you take a step. It's something I struggle with personally. I happen to be a very status-driven person. It's written into my personality profile. And when some people think well of me, and I have sort of the symbols of like, I love calling myself a founder. It's such a weird thing, but it's like, oh, it feels good. Everyone has their things. So I would say that it's going to be a, a, clearly a lifelong battle, something we're going to think about all the time. But I had a conversation with a woman a couple weeks ago who joined our program. And she said something really profound that I used to say all the time to people. She was like, you know what, I'm really scared of change. I'm really not sure what I'm going to do. And I've only worked at this one company. And she's like, but you know what, this is my life. I'm not going to let any of that steal my joy. And she just decided. You know what I mean? Um, and I just remember thinking, oh, wow, like, I'm trading a title for all my joy, you know? In some ways, you're trading whatever this person or these people expect or think of you for the fullness of your own, the desires of your heart, and the joy you could be experiencing. And I think when you start to see the cost benefit like that, it becomes a little bit easier to break away from those things. But it'll take time. I think it's a great question. The two biggest things that keep people from, I think, working with us or even tackling this area of our life is confidence and then that. It's a wonderful question. We can talk more Yes. Um, so the, the step four, maintaining career clarity for life. Yes. Is that, is that essentially revisiting step one through three? Or is exactly. It yeah. So that's the process that I've seen work really well for our students and for myself personally. Is that if we consistently check in on a routine basis then we can manage for when life changes and when our circumstances change. And we can change our choices. So this is a personal thing that I'll share. Um, my dad passed away about five years ago. And I was working with a really incredible counselor at the time and, and a business coach. And so I was kind of like taking their advice and playing it off of the other. And what the business coach did really well was help. Was he, he made it OK to make my business number two in that moment in time. Right? He's like, what do you want the most? And I was like, well, can I be honest? He's like, yeah, that's why I'm your business coach. And I said, I want a guilt-free day with my dad each week, where I'm not wishing I was working or thinking I'm ne neglecting some other thing over here that I'm supposed to be doing, but just guilt-free. If all we did was watch the Hunger Games trilogy, that would be fine, you know? Which, by the way, we did. So he said, OK, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to structure your week. So that we you know, prioritize these activities on Monday, these activities on Tuesday, that will waterfall into Wednesday and Thursday, so that if you don't do anything on Friday, you will have gotten all of your stuff done. And I was like, that's beautiful, right? And, 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 but it required checking in and asking myself, what are my values right now based on those circumstances? 
and it just relieved all the anxiety of worrying that I wasn't doing the right thing or spending my time in the right place or I was like, I do um, a responsibility, you know what I mean? So to me, career clarity for life is like prayer and checking in, you know, discernment consistently. But we've got to do it, we've got to get, I think, I don't know, now I'm getting all philosophical. But I think we kind of like help the process a lot, right? Like we co-create our reality right along with God. So we've got to be there with the data and the, the awareness in order to have epiphanies happen and have really awesome opportunities come our way. So that's my that's my two cents on, on the topic in my 34 years of existence <laughs> or the expertise. But I have been coaching this for seven years. I have students come back to us all the time saying, oh yeah, well for that season of life I was running my own thing. It's because they're checking in consistently and they're honoring what their values are at that time. It's a great question. Yes, and how can you? So how, how do you work with people? What is your service and how does Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, a career clarity program called Discover Career Clarity. It's 10 modules, and we teach it in three ways. Completely digital, so somebody can just watch the videos, we give them a workbook, they go through it on their own, lifetime. Then we have a medium version, which is the exact same thing, but you get four coaching sessions, and you can use them anytime you want. And then we have our like, VIP program, which is like, if I really want to tackle this, we give them a schedule, six to 10 weeks, and we hold them accountable to that schedule. We get eight coaching sessions. Um, it's all the same stuff, it's just structured slightly differently. Um, we've had now hundreds of people go through some iteration of that, primarily the VIP version, because when you're ready, you're ready. <laughs> Selfish. And I just thought what, what really got me was one of the guys I worked with 
finally came out and said, you know what, if I can do anything, I love construction, I love engineering, I, I studied it in college, and he gave me this soliloquy on like, cement, and he just he loved it. And I wrote about this in the book, it's in the intro. And I remember being so angry at him, because the only thing keeping me in that job was not knowing what my big, exciting, passion thing was, right? And I just remember being like, get out! Like, what are you doing here, you know? So I think it all goes, the, the fake part goes back to just believing that we have purpose and knowing that we all have to work. So you can choose to not have a purposeful career, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to in, imbue your career with someone with God given purpose, I think that's totally worth aiming for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah good question. Tracy, do you want to ask yours and then we'll, we'll wrap? I know. Yeah. Please. No, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time because I don't know if this is going to until people. No. Oh!
look bad, you want to be a good friend. So it's, it's like moral mushy ground, right? Now, let's, the, the whole boundary setting thing, though, step one is to pause and reflect. Do I want to do this or not? Step two is to then name the value that you might be compromising if you do this thing. So this could be called integrity, let's say. Step three is then to ask yourself, do I want to set a boundary around my integrity? And if the answer is yes, you go on to step four, which is, okay, well, how am I going to respond? And then step five is actually enforcing and responding, that boundary, responding to that boundary. So in this case, a consequence that you could articulate would, would be really simple. Um, hey, you know what? I really would love to help you out with this, but I, I really value my integrity, and lying is just a no-go for me. So if you keep asking me, I'm going to keep telling you no, or eventually I'm just not going to consider you a word friend anymore. And when you set a clear boundary, if you keep asking me, I'm going to keep saying no. So at least say no, right? Which also requires you to say no. Yeah. So the, my no's are like, I have too much business. Ooh. You see what I'm saying? So yes. It's not a problem with a person or anything else. And so you're taking on extra work because you know you can help them. Just because I love them. But also, I have to look. I'm gonna split. And I have, you know, you know, I'm getting older and you cup. know, whatever. But is your I, cup I, empty? Huh? Your cup is empty? Yeah, yeah. And um, but in in every year, I do set more boundaries. Like a, you know, help people within only ten minutes of my house. You know, mm -hmm. coming up with those, finding other people for whatever. But I gotta be happy with. You know, I'm just gotta be good with all. Exactly. And just like, like you said, it's just more boundaries. Boundaries that are, so for me, the boundaries that I hold really well are the ones that are values driven when I've checked in on what those values actually are. If they're arbitrary values that don't have a whole lot of like juice behind them because I haven't identified that exact value of what I would do in that time where I am setting that boundary, then it gets wishy-washy. So try to try the, the deep dive core values exercise and see if you can give some of those boundaries a little bit more um, meat, if you will. Does that make sense? Oh, great question. Thank you. Yeah, mostly. Anybody else? You want to
have Zeke here recording, and he does such a fabulous job at our church with all of the live streaming masses as well, and so we're just very thankful to have that. So, um, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, Lord, thank you for this time that we've had, and for our wonderful speaker, Tracy. Um, I hope that we've each gotten that nugget that we can then take back. We know there's still work to be done. There may be some journaling. There may be some um, quiet time that we need to really deep dive into some of these uh, exercises that could help us um, have that clarity that we are looking for. And um, we just ask that we serve you and give you the glory in all that we do. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you.